Well, this morning, as we're thinking about opening to Revelation chapter 9, I was thinking with you uh, of even that, that title there, The Bottomless Pit and the Demons. Have you ever wondered why we would even want to study something like that? Why would we want to look into what is arguably the, the darkest chapter of the Bible, the one most filled with the incredibly horrific, malignant creatures that are so evil, God keeps them locked up all the time in this abyss. Well, the truth is that for most of us, Satan, demons, the kingdom of darkness, we're almost blissfully ignorant of that. We don't think much about it. We're not prepared for or, or even recognize the presence of Satan and his demons as he seeks to neutralize, marginalize, and, and basically keep us powerless and unable to do the will of the Lord. Well, this morning, I'd like to talk with you about how to beware of Satan's plans for believers. This is uh, an introduction. We won't actually get to the ninth chapter of Revelation until the very end, and we're going to launch into every word of it in the days ahead. But on this Sunday morning, and at a historic evangelical Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church, most of us know far too little about the tactics, the strategies, and the methods of Satan. And for that reason, we need to heed the Lord's warnings to beware of Satan's plan for believers. The bottom line is, if we're going to be on guard against our adversary, we have to know what he does. We have to recognize his presence. We have to repent and forsake any time that he has gotten a foothold into our lives. I was thinking back and talking with someone uh, this morning as they saw the topic, and I thought over 35 years of pastoring in Christ Church, there have been time after time after time where I've seen one of the most obvious manifestations of the devil. I've seen the gathering of the Lord's people as they come to pray and prepare for serving in the church, and, and there are those things called business meetings. Those usually bring out the worst in a lot of people. And, and I, I, have, I remember once when Bonnie and I were pastoring in New England, I said to her, I said, I have never heard Christians yell in church at each other until I came to a business meeting. Did you know there are believers who are taken captive by the Lord to do his will in their seeking to promote strife in Christ's church? That's just one way that Satan works. And if we're going to recognize his presence, if we're going to face his onslaughts, if we're going to overcome his attacks against us, we need to do and follow and understand the ways that God's word instructs us to beware of him. In Revelation 9, in this short little view through it, the next few weeks that we're going to take, we will be taught the immense amount of the unseen and horrifically powerful kingdom of darkness that all around us shapes everything. Do you remember, nothing is neutral. There is no middle ground. Either it's of God or it's not. And if it's not, it's not neutral. First John 5 says, all of the world is in the lap of the evil one. And Satan uses every means, every method, every medium for his message. But he cloaks himself as the angel of light. And he seeks to deceive by counterfeiting the truth. And, and just like when we trick mice and rats by giving them what looks like good wheat or good grain, it just has 0.5% poison. 99.5% pure, 0.5 is deadly. Point anything is deadly. Well, in 1 Peter 5 this morning, and I, I want you to turn there with me. This is where we're going to begin to look at Revelation chapter 9. In 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9, we are confronted by the Apostle Peter with a charge to the church. He said, I want you to enter into the cosmic conflict. I want you to understand and what you're going to face every day increasingly the darker our world gets. And we are not supposed to be passive. We are supposed to be 
actively, vigilantly, guardedly resisting the evil one. So, 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9. Let's stand together if you got it. Follow along. I put it on the screen if you don't have a Bible or if you just want to look up. And this is what we're going to read together, okay? So if you don't have a New King James, you need to look at the screen. And let's read in unison, okay? Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Let's bow. Father, I pray that we'd realize that Satan is real. He's powerful. He's malignant. He is devious and cunning, supernaturally, powerfully wise in his strategies to beguile, to neutralize, to dull, to make our lives cold and distant from you. You've told us, you've warned us, he can devour us. Those words were written by a man who experienced being devoured, Peter, in his denials. And Lord, I pray that we would learn to resist the evil one and all of the kingdom of darkness actively uh, in a focused biblical way so that he will not have an, an, a foothold, an opening, a snare that he can trick us into in our lives. We ask that now for your glory and by the power of your spirit as you open our hearts to your truth. In the name of Jesus, we ask that. Amen. You may be seated. As you're seated, what are Satan's plans? If, if we wanted to just kind of understand what his plans are, how Peter himself, who wrote those words, succumbed to Satan's plans. In fact, the, the words in 1 Peter 5 that you have before you where it says uh, that, that we are supposed to be on guard or vigilant, that's the exact same word Jesus said three times to Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, Peter, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. Peter, watch, be vigilant, Gregoreo is the word, and, and pray so you don't fall into him. Peter, watch, be vigilant. But Peter went to sleep. He underestimated his own strength and the devil's strength. And so just as Jesus warned Peter three times to be vigilant, Peter failed three times and denied Christ three times. See, when we're not aware of Satan's tactics, his strategies, his methods, and when we are not conscious when he has come into the situation, for example, James put it this way, he said when we're operating with God, the wisdom is from above, the wisdom that God pours out on us is pure and peaceable and gentle and easily entreated and full of mercy without hypocrisy. That's what God brings. But he continues to say, what is from beneath, what is earthly and sensual and demonic is envy and strife and selfish ambition and confusion. Whenever things in the church get striving, confusing, ambition is present, that's when the wisdom is not being heeded from above. It's, it's where Satan has snared believers. So, what is Satan's strategy? What is his playbook? How do we get devoured by him? Well, if we're aware this morning that Satan wants to poison our thoughts and emotions, then we'll see that any time we get away from the purity of God's truth, Satan's at work. And what does he work on? He works on our minds. The battleground is the mind. Our mind is the conduit, the communications, the receptor to the spiritual world. It's our mind that processes words and turns them into spiritual truth that we interact into experiential knowledge of God. It's our mind that the devil wants to neutralize. And if he can neutralize our minds, dull them, fill them with doubt and with fears and with error, what we believe dictates how we behave. So if we believe right, we behave right. If we believe wrong, we behave incorrectly, ungodly, and wrong. 
Satan is the father of lies. He wants to snatch the word of God from us so we think that sin is not so bad as God says it is. Remember Jesus said that, that when the word of God is, is proclaimed, it's like seed being thrown out, but the devil comes right behind and snatches that word away. That happens all the time. It happens by people being distracted by everything and they, they, they are looking and, and thinking about everything except the truth of God. And they wonder why it is, why that thought crossed their mind that just got them derailed. It is not anything less than Satan's desire to distract us from the conscious response to the Word of God. As a devil, he wants us to learn to laugh at sin on television or in the movies, to dull our consciences so it will no longer warn us of God's displeasure with sin. As Satan, he wants to entertain us with sin so that we become very tolerant of it. He wants to fill our minds with doubts and lies and false doctrines. You see, when Satan begins to entertain us with sin, we doubt what God has said. I mean, that's just where we are in our culture right now in the world. We are being entertained by sin. And, and it is immorality that is the underlying theme of everything. And immorality is against God's standard. And so the more that we are comfortably entertained by immorality, the less we really believe that this God we've never seen that's so far away we don't even know where he is, that he could be right about those, those very hard and, and very strong standards that his word places before us. As Satan, he wants to entertain us with sin so that we become very tolerant of it. He wants to cloud our minds with those doubts about God's goodness, lies about his faithfulness, false doctrines, that debilitates our wills, that confuses our emotions, that corrupts our desires, and then draws the affection we're supposed to have for Christ away from him. And that's, that's his desire, and that's his active pursuit today. Well, if we understand Satan's strategy, we'll recognize it. If you want to turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy 2, this is a fascinating passage where Paul talks about how Satan gets involved in the lives of believers and how we're supposed to respond to that. And basically, just as we saw Peter teach us that we're to be on constant guard for Satan's attack, Paul warned us in 2 Timothy 2 that Satan can snare believers. He can, he can turn them away and, and attract them away from what God's purposes are as they gather into anything but God's purposes. And, and look what verse 23 says in 2 Timothy 2. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. One of the underlying evidences of Satan's presence is when Satan comes into a situation, strife begins. Satan is one who causes strife. He sows discord among believers. And there's, there's foolish and ignorant disputes. And, and that generates strife. In verse 24, the servant of the Lord must not quarrel. Uh, we are not to be known, if we are true servants of the Lord, as quarrelsome, but rather as gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. Now look at verse 26. This is what happens. This is what goes on. This is what neutralizes. In fact, Someone asked me, where, where were you last Sunday? I said, oh, well, last Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, Bonnie and I were doing a retreat. I mean, Bonnie was invited to do uh, a women's retreat for a few hundred ladies on Titus II, and I was invited to do a men's retreat on Titus II, the men's part, and she did the women's part. Then we were both invited to go to a, a church and do a, a similar Sunday morning, uh, uh, she with the ladies and me with the whole congregation. And as I looked out at the, and, and read about this group I was meeting with, most of them, almost 90%, were full-time Christian workers and counselors, Christian teachers, missionaries, and pastors. And, and they were, were on the front line of experiencing what it says right here, if you look at this. They experience in their lives what verse 26 says that they, they confront people that need to come to their senses and escape. And look what happens to people. Believers are snared of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Have you ever been with a believer and all of a sudden you hear them sharing things they shouldn't share, dis, discrediting, slandering, spreading 
gossip, and, and you look at them and you go, whoa, that just doesn't seem right. What have they done? Look at verse 26. They have been taken captive to do Satan's will. In fact, the word slander in English is actually a translation of the Greek word, which is the name of Satan, the devil. Slander is the devil. Only the devil is his proper name, but the meaning of the name is slander. Satan is primarily one who slanders, accuses, and when believers are slanderers and accusers, verse 26 says, they have been ensnared by the devil and they're taken captive. Well, how did they get snared? Well, the word right there, look in verse 26, that word snare is a word that God chose. It's the word pagus. It means primarily anything that fastens or holds something fast. People can get fastened to something that the devil wants them to do, and they're stuck to it, and they get gripped by it. It also is used for a noose, a snare, and a net. And Satan is at work setting snares that he wants us to get fastened onto. It's anything but God's word, God's will, and God's plan. And if he can distract us, pull us, snare us, stick us to anything but the wisdom that's from above, then he's accomplished his purpose. As believers, we can become ensnared by false doctrines. Now, what are those? Ones that are not grounded in the Word of God. Ones that are our preference or ones that are what we've heard but not what God says. We can also get snared by any of the sins that so easily beset us, as it says in Hebrews 12. We have to constantly be setting aside any encumbrances because we're so easily beset by sins. Paul says that we can get stuck onto snares and become trapped in our minds and intoxicated by the devil. In fact, I like what one commentator said, and I'll read it to you. He was preaching through this passage, and in two, two and a half sentences, he says, a world of truth. He says, it is only through God's grace and provision of repentance and knowledge of his truth that anyone, including sinning believers, ever come to their spiritual senses. So when it, when it says, look again in verse 26, that they may come to their senses, what does that mean? It means they're not in their senses. They're intoxicated, they're inebriated, they're, they're controlled by something outside of them, which is basically the snare of Satan. Then he continues, anelepho, come to your senses, literally means to return to soberness, indicating that falsehood and sin produce what might be called a type of spiritual inebriation. Believers enter a stupor resulting in their loss of judgment and the proper control of their faculties. The destructive effect of teaching falsehood and sin numbs their conscience, confuses their mind, erodes their convictions, and paralyzes their wills. And we see that. Have you ever seen a believer acting very much not like a believer? And you look at them and you say, what is going on? Very likely they have been snared to do the will of Satan. Well, as believers, let me get to this. Look at 1 Timothy 6, 9, because if we don't move on, we'll not get to uh, Revelation 9. But back up to 1 Timothy and look at chapter 6, because... Any believer can get snared by Satan. And in 1 Timothy 6, 9, Paul earlier in his first epistle to Timothy warned him to tell the church this. But those who, and, and look at the way Satan can snare people. Those who desire to be rich. Richness means stacked up wealth. It means having enough for a long period of time. There is a great danger that comes in stacking riches. You say, really? Yeah, that's why 80 to 90% of the world, by almost anyone's standards, live in poverty compared to us, compared to most of the world, the industrialized world. Most people live in poverty, and we get snared if we desire to be rich. What's the snare that we have? Well, look what he says. Into many foolish and harmful lusts. We think that the Lord blesses us so we have so much money that we can just spend on any foolish and harmful, lustful thing we want, indulging ourselves and, and having anything we can dream of and even going beyond our possessions and borrowing to even have more pleasures and fulfilling our lusts of the eyes. We want everything to be beautiful, and our pride of life we want to show off, and the lusts of the flesh we want to please, our endlessly hungry desires. 
And Paul says, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare. There's the word that we're looking at. That word pagus, a snare, something that sticks to us, that pulls us away from what God wants us to do. It, it's like a noose and it tightens and it, it constricts the blessing of God. It's a snare. And what does it lead to? Many foolish, verse 9 says, and harmful lust, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Now, as if we didn't understand what he was talking about, he continues. Look at verse 10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and have, look at this, pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now think of what Satan wants to do. Satan traps believers into wasting their lives chasing after riches. Have you ever thought about how ungodly it is to constantly want more and better? Now, when we read that, we, you know, look at verse 9. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare. We read that, and it's almost like we have a little schizophrenia going on. God says that, but we encourage in every way. Oh, get the better job. Get the higher paying job. Get the, high, oh, go to 10 times more years of school. You need more and more and more. You've got to have security. You've got to have financial. And what does it do? It pierces them through with harmful lusts that drown men in destruction. And it breeds greediness, and it pierces them with many sorrows. These believers think they can handle all the lusts that are fed by riches, but they can't. See, the Puritans put it well. For every one that can stand riches and wealth, 99 can handle adversity and suffering. People are not usually destroyed by their faith when they have adversity and suffering. It just makes everything else seem like it's worthless except for the Lord because they, they have nothing. And so that's why Jesus said how, how the poor people, they seek me, but how hardly shall the rich enter the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because when we lose everything, we only have the Lord. But when we have everything, we don't need the Lord, we think. You know, look at the end of verse 10. It says, they pierce themselves through with many sorrows. People who long for riches are just self-inflicting spiritual wounds that are terrible to their souls, to their spiritual being. And as they weaken and get sick spiritually, they slowly drift away from the food and health for their souls that only flows from the word of God. They get so distant from encouraging biblical nurture that flows from the gathering of the body of Christ at his church. Over time, they become pierced and wounded and crippled and sorrow-filled and unable to serve the Lord because of their self-directed, self-damaging pathway they've chosen for themselves and their families. You know what's so interesting? People that don't have toys don't spend the weekends playing with them. People that don't have endless money to chase after exotic everything usually are the ones that have time for the Lord. And so he goes on. In fact, if you want to back up to chapter 3, it gets worse. He says, Satan is so strong that even godly mature believers can get snared if they're not vigilant. In 1 Timothy 3, 7, there's a warning right in the middle of the qualifications for elders in Christ's church. And it says, watch out. After he's already said, watch out that their family's in order and their finances and that they're not greedy of, of gain that they shouldn't be greedy for, he says, watch out in verse 7. Moreover, this elder must have a good testimony among those that are outside. It isn't just that he's great inside the building. There has to be resonance out there in the world as a representative of Christ. Why? Lest he fall into reproach in the snare of the devil. Even spiritual office, even spiritual position and, and evident spiritual maturity doesn't protect from the snare of the devil unless there's constant vigilance. And that's what Paul warns about. Well, remember this, only God's word prepares us for Satan's attack. You don't even have to turn there because you know this verse by heart. Man shall not live by what? Bread alone. But by what? Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. When did Jesus say that? 
The context is everything. Jesus is facing the devil 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. He hasn't eaten. He's weakened. He is under constant assault. And yet he says, my way of defeating the devil is not using the power of the Godhead, but to use the same sword of the Spirit that every believer has. You see, the only God's word prepares us for Satan's attack. And when Jesus met and defeated Satan, he did it only by quoting verses that we all should know. Well, if you turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4 real quickly, uh, this, this uh, it's just across the page in my Bible. Look at what it says in the first two verses of 1 Timothy 4. It, it's the rising tide of evil in the empire of darkness. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, the closer we get to Christ's return, the closer we get to his prophetic promises, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits, doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with hot irons. And then turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, the next book over. Look at the first five verses. Paul continues to identify these end times. And, and he said, this is Satan's plans for the last days, to neutralize the church in the most vital time to be a light for the Lord. He says, but know this, 2 Timothy 3, 1, that in the last days, perilous times will come. That word perilous is stressful. We live in the most stressful time. People live under constant stress of everything, whether it's financial or work stress or, or terrorist stress or, or health stress. We just know too much. It's perilous times. But look what characterizes the world at the end. Verse 2, men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. They're willing to abandon family, home, marriage, church, anything for money. Boasters kind of characterizes our social media. It's the in-your-face, let-me-broadcast-everything world. Proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving. Devilish tongues, that's what slanders mean. Those who surrender their tongues to slander and malign like the devil, the accuser, without self-control, brutal, despising good. Doesn't that characterize where our culture is? Despising good, making fun of good. Lovers, uh, excuse me, um, Headstrong, haughty, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good. There we go, verse 4. Traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Now look at verse 5. The result, having a form of godliness. They go through the motions. They go to church. They look godly. But denying its power. From such people turn away. Wow. Paul continues. Look at the, the very next chapter, chapter 4. He says that wordless living leads to world-like living. I charge you, verse 1, chapter 4, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season, out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching, verse 3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Yeah, I just came from a weekend with all these people in the ministry. In fact, it's not uncommon to hear this. You see, people just don't want to be taught from the Word of God. They want to be entertained. They want a short sermonette for a Christianette who is on their way to something else, and there is no attention to the Word of God. Did you know most churches... When men are coming in, I've talked to them from, from the seminaries and the places where the Bible institutes where I teach, they say, when these trained students of the Word of God go out, they're told, now, 20 minutes, 15, 20, 25, that's most that people can endure. That's all that they'll tolerate. Look, look at where that comes from. Verse 3, for the time will come when they will not endure healthy doctrine, sound doctrine. We're there. And what's happening is the church is just eroding and, and accommodating to it. And, and the, the entertainment part of the service dominates, but the teaching part of the service doesn't. 
You know, one of the saddest things I've ever heard, someone told me this week, they said, did you know, there, there are a whole group of people at Calvary that have said, we'll not sit through another Revelation sermon, so as soon as the music's over, they leave. Why? Because they will not endure sound teaching. They said, I'm not going to hear it anymore. That's amazing. What does it say? But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they heap up for themselves teachers, and they turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to fables. So that's why Revelation 9 is so important. Because, and just turn there with me. At least we have to get there because it's time for communion. But when you turn to chapter 9, you're turning to a chapter of the Bible that unmasks what Satan's doing, his plans, and the power that he wields as the God of this world. And in obedience to God's desire that we read and hear and keep these doctrines in Revelation, it has to be that we study it. In fact, Revelation 1-3, the book opens saying that God specifically gave the truth of Revelation to Jesus Christ for Jesus Christ to give to his church and for his church to read and listen and heed. So what does chapter 9 say? It says the whole world is offered a choice. Christ offers endless life and the devil and his demons and the destroyer that is right now enslaved in the abyss, held in confinement, offers endless death. And the bottomless pit gives us lessons from God about the activity, the way that Satan neutralizes deadens, divides, and basically renders believers powerless in this world. Well, how can we apply that today? I mean, that's, you don't want to end, you know, if you have a painting, you have to get a white path out of it. People don't like staying in a bleak picture. Well, what's, what is a lesson for our everyday lives that we could draw from from such a, a glimpse into the darkest chapter of the Bible? Well, when Martin Luther was studying this, he actually wrote a poem that he taught to the reformed, uh, the Reformation converts that were coming to Christ out of their darkness and lostness. And he wrote this, and it became the theme of the church. And it's called, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And so what I'd like you to do is, uh, why don't you stand with me to prepare for communion, which we're going to have in just a moment. Let's read this first stanza. And then I want you to notice the next stanza, because it's all about what we're talking about. And then we'll just before communion, sing that third stanza. But let's just read this. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. Now, you've got to watch out. This song is like the entrance ramp to the highway. It starts real fast. So here we go. You ready? <clears throat> Everyone clear your throat. Here we go. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The Spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindred go. This mortal life also the body they may kill. God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is 
forever. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the privilege we have to commune with you at your table. We thank you that the spirit and the gifts are ours through you who triumphed. And greater are you who are in us than he, the evil one, and his wicked minions that are in this world. But you've told us we have a responsibility to resist him. I pray that at this communion, it would be a communion where we say, I refuse to be entertained by sin. I will not laugh at sin. I will not be amused by sin. I will not be surrendering myself to be dulled, for the Spirit of God to be grieved and quenched by the things that I allow through the media to permeate my mind. I pray that this would be a communion of our fellowship with you, the Holy Son of God, who loved us and gave yourself for us. Bless us as we partake of these pictures of your body and of your blood, which were given for us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As you're seated, we're going to sing of our precious Redeemer and his name that's above all other names. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess him, King of glory now. Tis the Father's pleasure, we should call him Lord, who from the beginning was the mighty word. Humbled for a season to receive a name from the lips of sinners unto which he came. Faithfully he bore it, spotless to the last, brought it back victorious when through death he passed in your hearts enthrone him there let him subdue all that is not holy all that is not true Crown him as your captain in temptation's hour. Let his will enfold you in its light and power. Jesus, Lord and Savior, shall return again. With his Father's glory, or the earth to reign. For all wreaths of empire meet upon his brow, and our hearts confess him, King of glory now. Tis the Father's pleasure, we should call him Lord, who from the beginning was the mighty word, was the mighty word. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father. And he said to us, This is my body, which I gave for you. Do this, and remember me. Let's partake together.
And dear Father, we thank you that Jesus not only came to live the perfect life that none of us could ever live, but he also died the perfect death, pouring out his blood to make the atoning sacrifice to forever remove the punishment for our sins upon himself, the record of our sins upon himself, and to thus make us the righteousness of God in him. Thank you for the blessing of what you did at the cross. As we hold these cups in our hands and sing to you, may the wonder of how much you've forgiven us overwhelm us with grateful joy. In the name of Jesus, we ask for that. Amen. As we sing about the cross, the men are going to pass the cup among us, and we're going to worship the Lord. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for sinners such as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Let's just read the second stanza. I always think about um, not only my first communion as a married man, but many afterward. I grew up in the church. I know all the hymns. I don't even need the hymn book. I mean, I've been singing them for 57 years. And I was married to this recently converted at 21 uh, dear wife of mine. And we were standing for the first time at communion at Grace Community Church. And I was just roaring out the stanzas, and I couldn't hear her singing. I turned and looked. And there were these huge tears running down her face. And immediately I thought, oh, no, brand new husband. What did I do wrong now? And I said, honey... I'm so sorry, what's wrong? She says, I just can't believe how much the Lord forgave me. You know, to whom much has been forgiven, the same what? Loves much. Let's think about that as we read this and then we sing after that to the one that loved us. Was it for crimes that I have done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity grace unknown, and love beyond degree. And as we sing that chorus, feel and, and remember the burden of my sins rolling away. Here we go. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart, it rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. And the scriptures say all that was accomplished through the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ, in whom we have redemption, even the forgiveness of our sins. And Jesus said, do this cup drinking, remembering the new covenant that's in my blood. Drink from it, all of you. Let's partake together. Lord, I pray that we would resist the devil, that we would decide we'd look through our viewing habits, our listening habits, our gaming habits, our entertainment, our recreation, and say, I don't want to be ensnared by the devil to anything. I don't want my mind, my tongue, my emotions to be governed by the evil one. But I want to live unto you that love me and gave yourself for me. And this morning, oh Lord, I know that with a congregation this size, there's always someone that either has never really met you, they've never been born again, or they have great needs and they've They've taken many steps away from you, and they need to take that one step back. 
And so I pray at the end of this service as the elders and our Titus two women minister the word here at the front that you will draw to yourself those who either need to come to have their sins forever removed or need to come to be reminded of the great work of salvation in their life. But bless us as we live for you. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people said, amen, and God bless you as you go.